Greetings metalheads! I hope you're into violent horror because today we're delving into what is I think the most twisted and disturbing song by Cradle of Filth, Lord Abortion. When you're into extreme metal, every day is Halloween. But I think this is one of those songs that qualifies quite chilling, so it fits the theme quite well. One or two of you guys requested this, so I was only too happy to oblige. My videos aren't monetized, but if they were, this video would definitely ruin me because it talks about the most despicable things, both sexual and violent. But I don't really believe in censorship when it comes to art, and if you listen to extreme metal, I assume neither do you. If you don't know this song, and I know I have some viewers who will be listening to this for the first time, brace yourselves. In short, today we're talking about necrophilia. Hmm? As I mentioned in my previous video on uh, Cradle of Filth's Tearing the Veil from Grace, one common theme in their median album is monsters, and in Lord Abortion we see the perspective of a deranged psychopath. What I find interesting about this song is that it has a deeper meaning than just to shock. I love the shock factor just as much as the next person. Being shocking is a great way to challenge cultural taboos and to make a statement against censorship and about human nature. And the aggressiveness of metal music is cathartic, and it is scientifically proven. There's little that can calm me and fans of this type of music down when I'm angry better than some artistic screaming and cursing fate. Heavy metal and extreme metal in particular is a weird place to be, so it doesn't lack examples of references or descriptions of necrophilia, sexual abuse, perversion of all kinds. L think of something like Cannibal Corpse, where we have endless lyrics describing in great detail the goriest and most disgusting things. But with little artistry, as far as I'm concerned, another discernible purpose than to be shocking. And when a performance relies on being shocking but there's no more depth to it, it can get old and stupid real quick. But Lord Abortion manages to shock and still has layers and layers of meaning. Firstly, in the psychology of the speaker, we get to see the story of his life, the origins and mechanisms of his twisted behavior, and secondly, the humor. Dark humor. Very, very dark. So we have in this song the life of a necrophile told in his own words, kind of like Nabokov's Lolita, only it's a different kind of philia. So let's listen. What a powerful beginning. The speaker began his life in blood and gore, a result, a byproduct of violence. He was not a baby, but debris cast from his mother. He wasn't born, but cast out. He was forced out of the womb, aborted, but survived. I'm not sure if the blood, the waters of life running slick, and uh, the words slaughter and stab wounds are a metaphor for abortion, or if his mother was killed and his birth happened 
posthumously. Um, in the first case, um, I spat in the waters of life would uh, suggest his loathing of his mother's attempt to kill him. Um, in the latter, it could mean that he was spat out, as in expelled from the womb. I'm curious to know which uh, theory you guys are leaning towards. I don't think uh, cinders is meant to suggest that a burning was involved. I see it as having the sense of remnant, maybe a remnant of the unlucky stars, or lucky depending on how you see it, that brought about his brutal birth, because uh, he refers to himself as uh, debris from stars. In either case, uh, he miraculously survives, but he will forever be marked and defined by this traumatic inception in his life. He says, dub me Lord Abortion, it is the way he wants to be referred to, turning this gruesome event into a thing of pride, a nobility title. Significantly, he calls himself the living dead, as he feels more in tune with the dead than with the living, and this will be uh, very significant, of course, for his philia. And I think that this is really clever, a very intelligent way to uh, uh, to um, foreshadow uh, what will be going on in the rest of the song and in the rest of his life, and a very um, intelligent uh, um, explanation for uh, uh, his deviant behavior. And here comes the dark humor, the double meanings. The back seat may be used for giving head and rear entries, but with the serial killer, uh, the back seat may hold a bone saw, and the rear entry could be knife sharp and have a bloody exit. And taking the victim's head would be more appealing than receiving head. With a necrophile, it could well be both in whichever order. And that's the killing joke. Whatever happened to his mother, he did not grow up with her. His bastard father that raised him was promiscuous and violent and potentially a pedophile, or at least this is how uh, I read uh, cunts cut out of puberty, so uh, uh, girls freshly out of puberty that he beat blue. And these are the only female influences in his life. These and the absent mother that aborted him. I love the aha uh -huh, nostalgia grows nine or ten times when he remembers the horrors of his childhood to break what is a terrifying tale but also something that can make us feel sorry for him. Interestingly, the grisly humor is meant to interrupt our blossoming sympathy for him because this is not a person that we want to sympathize with. And uh, we'll see this again, we'll see him as a tormented soul, but so much lacking in empathy that we cannot possibly feel compassion for him. His soul is a den of vice, and I love how he takes come again, as in Jesus' second coming, in a sexual way, because of course he does. Um, he would die for resurrection only because coming again, the orgasm on a roll, as he calls it, is fun. We start to see more of his sadistic pleasure. Killing and dismembering gives him sexual gratification. The serrated rape of the knife across skin and sinew. He waxes poetic as he describes the tears of his 
tortured victims with the words of Shakespeare Sonnet 18, shall I compare thee to a summer's day, thou art more lovely and more temperate. But then he decides that a grave is more appropriate because uh, he loves imagining places of death, right? So lichen is spelled um, L-I-C-H-E-N, uh, evoking a beautifully macabre image of moss growing on a gravestone in the shape of the victim's tears. <laughs> Horoscopes, I love this. A 12 part horoscope of horrors. His sickness and violence written in the stars, written in his tarot cards that always show death. So he's thinking back on his life, counting his years like beads on an abacus, that early counting instrument with beads, and realizes that he's a broken man. His heartstrings are undone. I love how heartstrings is rhymed with labial rings. Again, this striking association of words is meant to create humor and to break the empathy for his undone heartstrings. Did Danny think, hmm, what else can be undone other than heartstrings? Uh, buttons, past mistakes, or I know labial rings. You can undo those, right? And it rhymes too. Yeah, let's go with labial rings. Uh, you know those websites for rhymes where you write a word and then you're listed a ton of rhyming words? Sometimes idioms with three or four words in it, whole sentences even ridiculously unrelated to the word that you were searching? Heartstrings. I'm thinking of ending things. Yeah, it's like that. Danny could make a hell of a rhyme zone. So our killer now has a new victim in front of him, he is wearing a mask, part of his perverted game, and he is hard to watch her bleed. Consciousness is uh, blurring in and out of sanity. He knows uh, he is a sinner and he embraces his wickedness and sees his killing as liberating for the victims. They are cut in order to be cut some slack. A sinner in the hands of uh, a dirty god is a reference to the uh, 18th century sermon A Sinner in the Hands of an Angry God, which details uh, what punishment the sinners receive in hell. And uh, he fantasizes of a dirty god who lets him enact his vile desires. He compares himself with the 15th century serial killer Gilles de Rey, who was uh, involved in occultism and abuse and murder of children, to whom Cradle of Filth dedicates the entire of God's feed on the Devil's Thunder album. He is eager to kill uh, and he eviscerates his victim and dismembers her, saving parts of her 
for later use. And uh, the gruesome scene continues into what is the most disturbing part of the song, the culmination of it, if so far it hasn't been uh, disturbing enough. First of all, I love the way the instrumental changes here, slowing down as so as to let the voice be the focus, the narration of a despicable deed by the killer himself so that uh, we can become privy to his stream of consciousness. The further he sinks into his sick acts, the more he is aroused, his heart beating savagely like the war drums of jungle cult rituals. With every action, his appetite is only sharpened. The stabbing was only a hors d'oeuvre, an appetizer spelled like whore as in WH, until he loses himself completely. He wants his deed to culminate as he lays her down in a coffin, marveling at her otherworldly beauty, her face white like pearl, lips like ruby, dark hair, a queen of spades. She is unconscious at this point from blood loss because it says that she went out like a light, uh, even more so like the light in his mind where there's total fucking darkness when the sexual act occurs. Um, comparing himself again to a famous serial killer, this time Jeffrey Dahmer, he's saying that he knows he is a sick man and that what he does is bad, but he can't help it and that's his excuse. The lines, I kissed her viciously, maliciously, religiously, but when has one been able to best separate the three, are absolutely brilliant. Showing not only a contempt for religion, but also his justification that what he does is almost religious in ritual frenzy and hence acceptable. I actually think that this last line is the darkest one of the song. It's a reminder that uh, most often the motive of serial murdering is sexual domination. Their acts are rooted in hatred of their preferred sex, uh, as in their mind the victim deserves it. Look at how she, the female victim, was called a Venus mantrap, as in the uh, carnivorous plant, but it is ensnaring men, as if she is the sinful one luring him with lips and skin, and his only fault is falling into her trap. He calls her number 19, as uh, she is depersonalized, only another body in his count list. Bye. 
Now, awake to the torture, the victim screams at the top of her lungs, her seams undone showing the wounds he has caused, and uh, his last conversation is with divinity. For him, love is associated with despair and blood loss. Curses or prayers would fall on deaf ears anyway. And at the last moment, he weeps. Can we still feel sorry for him at this point? He weeps, but then the angels, like statues, merely and endlessly stare. Divinity can help either his victims or him. Wow, this was a hard-hitting song, and it's always interesting when I write this analysis because I discover nuances that I had overlooked before. I've uh, discussed in uh, some previous videos the male-female report in Cradle of Filth songs, and here the roles are absolutely reversed, with the male speaker being the with the male speaker being the monster and the center of the story depicted in the lyrics and the female playing the part of a mother and of an unsuspecting victim. So this was my analysis, everyone. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you do, please like and subscribe to my channel. Um, next, though, I will analyze another song from Median, as uh, I also announced in my previous video. And stay tuned for a new analysis of metal lyrics. Until next time, have a metal Halloween.